There are two presenters. Uh, first, Robert Stern, who I'll say a word to about, and then Judy, and then we can get going. Robin is the Associate Director of the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence. She co-developed Ruler, Yale's center approach to bringing emotional intelligence to the school and the workplace. <coughs> she has written a couple of books, Project Rebirth, Survival and the Strength of the Human Spirit from 9-11 Survivors, and also The Gaslight Effect, <laughs> which has, the term gaslight has risen to much prominence in large part because of uh, what Robin has written. And the book is now to print, and if you try to get it online, you have to mortgage your house. <coughs> but fortunately, it's going to be republished, and Robin has written an introduction to it. Judy Loeb it earned her doctorate in Rutgers in 1983. She is now on the Executive Council as a counselor at large in the American Psychoanalytic Association. She's in the Who's Who in America, Who's Who in American Women, Who's Who in the World, World Who's Who of Women. And that's just the beginning of what Judy has done. She was a supervisor um, at overseeing graduate students at Rutgers in the mid-70s, and one of the people she supervised was Nancy McWilliams. And, um, and she is still active. She lives now in Florida, and she does a variety of things, including flying. So she's going to demonstrate her flying <laughs> later. <laughs> and now, Robin's Thank you. Thank you, Judy, for inviting me. Good afternoon. Am I closer? All right. I was just saying thank you. There's nothing important <laughs> other than gratitude, but it's pretty important. Um, so these days, you can hardly go more than a day or two without seeing the word gaslighting appearing in a newspaper. The Urban Dictionary has defined gaslighting, and even our president has been called a gaslighter. But when I wrote the book, The Gaslight Effect, 10 years ago, the term was virtually unknown, although the phenomena itself was widespread. Gaslighting, I wrote, is a type of emotional abuse, a manipulation that seeks to sow seeds of doubt in a targeted individual or members of a group, hoping to make the targets question their own memory, perception, and sanity. This is actually a definition from Wikipedia. In gaslighting, the gaslighter tries to convince you that you're misremembering, misunderstanding, and misinterpreting your home behavior or motivations or character, thus creating doubt in your mind that you can see reality clearly. Gaslighting is always the co-creation of two people. The gaslighter, who is the more powerful person in the dynamic, engages in an ongoing systematic knocking down of the confidence in the gaslight tea, sowing seeds of doubt in his or her reality. The gaslight tea, the other player in the dance of ta in the tango, um, gaslight tango, is the less powerful person who, in order to keep the relationship going, allows himself or herself, himself or herself, to be knocked down and experiences a growing shakiness of self as he or she begins to doubt and question his or own, her own perception. The dance they do, I label the Gaslight Tango, which is a mutually created relationship that requires the active participation of two people. So I wasn't writing a scholarly article, I was writing a book, a popular book, because I really wanted people all over the country at every level to be able to understand it. And so I used names that were less clinical and more accessible to describe what was going on. You're so careless, the Gaslighter might say. And instead of simply laughing and replying, I guess that's how you see it, the gaslight tea would feel compelled to insist, I am not, because she cared deeply how her gaslighter would see her. She couldn't rest until she had convinced him that she was right and that she wasn't, in fact, careless. I don't understand how you can be so extravagant with your money, the gaslighter might say. A non-gaslight tea could reply casually, well, everyone's different. 
and that's my money and go on about her life. But a gaslighter might spend hours, a gaslight tea, I'm sorry, might spend hours locked in miserable self-reflection, ruminating desperately about whether her gaslighter might in fact be right. As I wrote in my book, the gaslight effect describes what happens to you when you begin to second guess yourself because you've allowed another person to define your reality and erode your sense of self, your confidence, and judgment. The gaslight effect is a consequence of a relationship that's co-created between two people when the gaslighter needs to be right in order to preserve his sense of self and having power in the world, and the gaslight T, the target of the gaslighting, who has allowed the gaslighter to define her sense of reality because she idealizes him and seeks his approval. This mutual participation is good news because it means that the gaslight T holds the keys to her own prison. In personal relationships, I understood from my practice and in my personal life, from my friends and even in my own marriage, once she understands what's happening, she can find it within herself to have the courage and clarity to refuse the gaslighter's story about her and the crazy making distortions that undermine her self-perception. So how did I discover the gaslight effect? The book was inspired by the prevalence of gaslighting in the lives of women I knew who were otherwise powerful and strong and decision makers. And somehow, they were questioning and second guessing themselves at the hands of somebody more powerful in their lives. So when somebody shows up with black and blue marks, with scars, with name calling, it's easy to blame the other person. But somehow, when there's a more insidious undermining of who you are, that more gradual chipping away at your sense of reality, many people I saw, and they were mostly women, blamed themselves. At its mildest, mildest, gaslighting leaves women uneasy, wondering why they always seem to end up in the wrong or why they aren't truly happy with seemingly good guy partners. At its worst, gaslighting leads to major depression with formerly strong, vibrant women reduced to abject misery and self-hatred. Either way, I was continually astonished both as a therapist and in my personal life, at the degree of self-doubt and paralysis that gaslighting can induce. But how did I name it? Named it because one night I was watching a movie with Ingrid Bergman and Charles Boyer. It's called Gaslight. And that was exactly what I was seeing in my practice over and over again. Ken didn't mention in, in my introduction that I've been Practice, in pra private practice in New York for 30 years. Um, trained at postgraduate center right here in New York and um, been seeing couples and women for many, many years. And I saw that this was happening over and over again. So let's take a look at the clip that was that defining moment for me. Bear with me a second, I'm just looking for the technology. Bergman, um, as a young girl, lost her aunt to murder. And she grows up, falls in love with someone who is very charming, charismatic, who wants to take her back to her hometown in London. Really, we, the audience, begin to figure out that the guy who she falls in love with was actually the person who murders her aunt. But we're going to see the beginnings of him, the uh, character, 
in the movie, played by Charles Boyer, trying to drive his wife crazy so that he can hospitalize her, then steal her jewels, and get all the inheritance that was meant for her. Most gaslighting is not that insidious, but sometimes it takes an extreme example to bring it home. We're coming, into, we're coming into the movie at a point where they're going on an outing early in their relationship. So in the meantime, while we're trying to get the technology to work, so I'd really like you to see the clip. Does this sound familiar to any of you? Yeah. You saw the movie. You saw the movie. Many of you. Okay. And so what about in your personal life? Yes. I see reversal in elderly couples, the women gaslighting the men. It's possible. I'm not going to say it's not. Of course, men and women are both gaslighters, um, can both be gaslighters. And it just so happens that in, the pra in my private practice, the pairing I saw most often was women coming into therapy because they didn't even know that they were being abused. But they knew that there was something wrong and they just couldn't put their finger on what was happening. And after I wrote my book, um, people kept coming into my office saying, how did you know exactly what was happening to me? Because they had looked for that description in self-help books. And there really wasn't anything around that detailed the progression into gaslighting from the, the moment where it seems like a silly comment somebody's making to something that you begin to think, well, like, why is he driving you crazy with this? And, and arguing with him to, to then the third stage where you really begin to take it on and you own it and think, gee, I am too sensitive. I am, you know, I am really crazy in this way. And, and uh, he's right. So thank you for making that comment because it's important that, that you know that it's not just women. Yes? No, I'm just wondering how you recommend if, if you're aware of being gaslit by someone, yeah. but you have to continue. We have to skip it. So you need to go back. Okay. So because I work at the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence. I'm very flexible and adaptable, and <laughs> we are not going to be thrown off because we can't see the movie. Um, but I uh, then, okay, so let me just go back here to the slide so we can just have a brief conversation. Um, what was your question? It was how do you advise your patients when they have to continue relating to someone who's trying to gaslight them? How do you advise them to relate to that person and not be gas? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think that can I ask you to hold that for sure. discussion? Sure. Okay. Great. Because yes, of course, in some relationships you can leave because they are either romantic relationships that are easy to end or not so easy that you end them, or friendships that. But what about if it's your family member or or your longtime partner or yes? Um, one more question. Yeah. Uh, Robin, I, I'm so glad you're here because I had that book, I mean, you know, identified with a lot. But I had one patient, who, a woman who was so masochistic, all the interpretations, of it, but I just gave you the book to read. And it opened her because of all of the examples she got. I mean, this was so long ago yeah, that she had to read the whole book before um, it really hit home. And this is, and a lot of it happens a lot with alcoholic um, people and, um, you know, women or men who are married to them and stuff like that. So I'm very pleased to meet you. And I, I think I gave one of my patients the book, and I don't have it anymore. <laughs> okay, well, it's going to be republished. So I'm just going to move through this more quickly because I want to um, 
leave the time that Judy needs. And I'll leave the rest of these slides to um, uh, after Judy's talk. So what happened was um, in between the, the years that I published in 2007 and um, probably as close to 2016, um, as I remember, Gaslighting would occasionally pop up when they, there was a review of the movie um, Zero Dark Thirty. They talked about the um, uh, interrogation techniques that really were undermining of people's reality. I worked for Facebook for a while and, and we were reporting on bullying and doing focus groups and, and noticed that among teens and young adults that gaslighting and the experience of, have, of sem somebody saying something to you and then 30 or 40 people liking that same thing was even more horrific because now you had 30 or 40 people at a time acknowledging that maybe there was something wrong with you when it was hard enough to stand up to one person, what do you do if it's on the internet, right, and on Facebook? So we created a bully prevention center that hopefully gives some advice to kids and parents and whatever, educators. And then um, in 2016, uh, gaslighting was really catapulted into popular press. Um, and John Oliver, the HBO comedian and show host, there he is, um, claimed that Donald Trump had gaslighted him because he, Donald Trump had tweeted out that he was invited four or five times to be on John Oliver's show. But in fact, John Oliver had never invited him. But he was so certain and so insistent that after a while, listening to that one channel of information, that one channel of certainty, John Oliver went back and asked his producers, hey, wait a minute, did, did I forget something? Did I actually invite Donald Trump? And of course he hadn't. He knew he was right. But the experience of somebody coming at him with that kind of certainty, when he had the humility enough to say, well, maybe, you know what, maybe I forgot, <laughs> caused him to second guess himself. Right? And what I realized in that moment is this wasn't a personal relationship. John Oliver wasn't invested in Donald Trump. So maybe the concept of gaslighting was becoming more so socio-political phenomena and less just a personal one. And I'm going to leave it to Judy to tell us more. Thank you, Robin. Um, I realized as Robin was talking, a couple of things occurred to me. I realized a transference reaction, which I had not been aware of. But in the 1940s, um, probably not that much longer after this movie, um, The Academy Award, my mother taught me about gaslighting. And she told me what it was. And I was in elementary school at the time. So it wasn't until this moment that I realized that when Robin's book came out, um, I had a very positive reaction. And I got in touch with Robin. And that's how I met Robin. And we did a, um, a program for the AAPCSW, the Psychoanalyst Social Workers, in 2009. Uh, and um, she's a joy to work with. So I want to thank you for coming today. So I called her um, when I had the idea um, on one of the listservs for God. I, I thought of the gaslighter in chief. So uh, here we go. Bill Maher quipped that sunlight is the best disinfectant. With this in mind, I've tried to shed some light on how our new administration <coughs> extends the concept of gaslighting into the social, cultural. And you need to talk into the mic. Into the social, cultural, political arena. Thank you. I have to get over my anxiety. Dr. Stern has described gaslighting and the gaslight effect in personal terms. I shall now apply them to the current social and political climate. I believe there are historical <coughs> precedents going back to at least the 1960s and that understanding some of the similarities and differences is worth exploring. Finally, I want to suggest some options to preserve democracy and stop authoritarian and gaslighting techniques. From the personal to the political, Robin and I hypothesize 
that our current administration and recent 2016 election extend the sinister concept into the social, cultural, and political arena. The Trump slogan, Make America Great Again, seared the alleged weakness of America into the group unconscious. It was especially heard by those whose frustration and anger were insufficiently recognized by the Clinton campaign. They felt duped by the political establishment dubbed the swamp by Donald Trump, who I call the Don. This is not a sudden manipulation or a brand new phenomenon or occurrence. Public opinion was manipulated during World War II and the McCarthy era and after and before. Robert David Steele, author of Intelligence for Earth 2010 and a former CIA case officer, argues that the lack of transparency, truth, and trust in our social and political climate is not new. In his opinion, the loss of integrity goes back at least to the 1960s with the FBI leadership of J. Edgar Hoover and the assassinations of John Kennedy and Martin Luther King. Now in our time, Charles Lewis, author of 935 Lies, The Future of Truth and the Decline of America's Moral Integrity in 2014, a book about presidential and government deception, says we are living in an era when up is down and down is up and everything is in question and nothing is real. As psychoanalytic psychohistorians, it is helpful to look beyond the role of government. Referring to President Trump, Alan Francis, a physician who was former editor of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, DSM-4, suggests that we must first analyze the societal sickness that gives someone so flawed the power to determine the fate of the world. An important question is whether presidential deception over the past 50 or so years has increased gradually and or changed along with the decline of America's moral integrity. I wonder if we have evolved from an age of narcissism to an age of sociopathy and psychopathy, or what a patient of mine prefers to call the age of apathy and greed, and now more than ever long for an age of integrity. Some historical antecedents and review and analysis, cultural factors. Dr. Ken Fuchsman, psychohistorian and current president of the International Psychohistory Association, has a most cohesive and integrated answer to the question of Dr. Alan Francis. What in our society gives someone so flawed the power to determine the fate of the world? You have to speak up. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Develop an intimate relationship with that mind. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get me started. <laughs> That's the idea. <laughs> um, in his in in his article, which I suggest you read in its entirety, the presidential campaign that astounded the world: a psychohistory of Donald Trump and the 2016 election is in the Journal of Psychohistory 20, 2017 spring. So I'm plugging it. I shall do my best to summarize his ideas, but I strongly recommend you read the article. There are four points. Our, government, our governmental structure, the separation of powers and electoral college, has led to the election of a candidate with a majority vote in the electoral college, but not the popular vote, five times. The United Two, the United States has a cultural pattern of long, almost endless political campaigns. These resemble sporting contests, like the Super Bowl, that focus on how things play politically more than policy details or the complex process of governing. <coughs> Three, campaigning and governing are quite different. The candidate has to know how to get and keep media attention and hold spirited rallies. Campaigners, not just Trump, point out the nation's problems, but are long on promises and short on specifics. Dr. Fuchsman 
describes the importance of arousing audience emotions as well as the use of religious overtones. A competent POTUS, of course, needs to have knowledge of the issues, work with Congress, and conduct foreign policy. I note that Trump blends the advantages and rhetoric of campaigning with the role of governing. Because he has already filed to run in 2020, he may hold campaign rallies, use Air Force One, and solicit campaign donations. Four, the degradation of previously high standards and accuracy of the print and broadcast media and the focus on contest and personality rather than the issues play a central role. Strongly connected to the changes in the news business is that we became a celebrity culture. Entertainment values, just as Trump describes in the taped conversation with Billy Bush, now supersede accuracy and truth. Cable news networks keep our interest, even creating dependency and addiction for some. I got addicted. Fuchsman points out that Trump has no compunction about exploiting our rituals or about going to the gutter and the sensational when the spirit moves him. He is a master of political publicity, a genius some, especially Trump, would say, and he would be right. <laughs> to me, there is also good news. The stronger role of the free press in our democracy is unfolding daily. Derek Thompson, senior editor at The Atlantic in a January New York Times opinion article, live from the White House, it's Trump TV, explains that there are three rules of popular entertainment. Each of them applies to Mr. Trump. First, every successful franchise has a mythical hero, whether a brave firefighter or a sociopath. The second rule is that distribution is more important than content. FDR reached tens of millions of people with his radio fireside chats, and TV presidential addresses became blockbuster events. But as entertainment options grew, Reagan's and Bill Clinton's star power diminished. It ended a golden age for the bully pipe pulpit, writes Thompson. Twitter in the hands of Trump has combined the old-fashioned direct line to voters with a major twist. His chief audiences are newspapers and television, not the public. He deftly blends a direct line to the voters with consistent amplification by the largest broadcasters. Last and worst, but not least, the third rule of popular entertainment is that Trump and Stephen Bannon work to establish a political media monopoly. They seek dominion over the, their own set of facts by demonizing critical and traditional news companies and sources in and outside the government. They promote sycophants, loyal to their view of reality, and label anything that disagrees with them as fake news. The hope of optimists and those of us who care is that this will lead the public to want and require investigative journalism and renewed civil engagement. President Trump has paradoxical instincts to condemn news companies while seeking their approval and to elevate popularity over politics and policy. He broadcasts a separate media reality. Derek Thompson writes, if he succeeds, the Trump show will be worse than reality television. It will not be reality at all. I believe this is our new reality. Beyond gaslighting, populism and the creation of yearning for a strong man rule. A thought-provoking prediction in January and current assertion by Mella Kalin is that clues about the psychology evoked in the Trump era are found in populist regimes around the world. He predicted that Trump would appoint new chiefs who would fight with their rank and file and try to downsize and defund and that there would be pushback. He expected that confusion and uncertainty would create a yearning for strongman rule and the, that institutions themselves would be eroded. 
Certainly it seems that relevant factors are the economy's perceived decline, the computer revolution's impact on manufacturing and international trade, the reduction of the middle class from 62% in 1970 to 43% in 2014, and beginning with September 11, 2001, dramatic awareness of suicide bombing, terrorist attacks. These are important factors in our so-called societal sickness, which leads to choosing a strong man like Trump to be in charge of the nuclear code. Middle-aged males, those without college degrees, and the middle class felt disenfranchised and became more conservative, sexist, nativist, and enraged. The hostility toward Congress, people of color, Jews, immigrants, and the other, along with envy and contempt toward high-achieving women, enabled Trump to successfully stereotype and exploit for his personal advantage. The end goal is the deadlock of due process while the strong leader takes the strategic heights of state power as done by Putin in Russia, Chavez in Venezuela, and Erdogan in Turkey. According to Kalin, populists take over by excluding and arresting journalists. Trump has told reporters he plans to eliminate the traditional White House press briefings, and it has been reported that he told FBI former FBI Director James Comey to put in jail those journalists who report <coughs> classified information. Populists create oligarchs who are loyal and indebted to them, and they ally with media rulers who have money and political influence. The personal and the intra-psychic inform the socio-political. A psychoanalytic modern conflict theory and dimensional diagnostic perspective. Before I discuss or speculate about Trump's psychological makeup, defenses or temperament, it's essential to consider that neurological or organic factors, especially in a man who will be 71 on June 14th, may contribute to his unique and unusual behaviors and actions. It is possible that what we see are signs of one of the dementias or a type of brain disorder. So much has been blogged, posted on my psychoanalytic reserves, and presented at conferences on life in the age of Trump. It's hard to keep up with it. Because we are limited in time today, my goal is to highlight a few of the controversies and apply two approaches that may be useful. In a nutshell, very bad and unintended, we psychoanalysts fight among ourselves about the ethics of diagnosing outside the consulting room. We argue about applying the Goldwater Rule which prevents psychiatrists from diagnosing public figures for taking the position in elections and political events. Isolation is a most important tool in the gaslighter's kit. Keep victims away from anyone who or anything that can provide a reality check, the Goldwater Rule. I do not wish to carelessly or inappropriately suggest for political motiv motivation that Trump exhibits a personality disorder or a composite of disorders in either the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, the DSM, or the Psychodynamic Diagnostic Manual, PDM, which is a dimensional rather than categorically, rather than categorical manual for diagnosis. Based on Trump's public statements and behaviors, which often distort reality or change facts, which are erratic and impulsive, and which have consistently documented, which are consistently documented in video and taped interviews, many psychoanalysts diagnose him from afar. We know that professionals in other fields, as well as non-professionals and lay people of any political stripe, also frequently diagnose and describe Trump psychologically, whether in the media or in conversations. <coughs> My analytic training in the 1960s and 1970s rigidly emphasized that diagnosis is for treatment, not for hostility or social disapproval. 
but my personal frustration and human imperfections sometimes cause a lapse. My primary care physician called Trump schizophrenic and psychopathic and sociopathic the week before the election. He said he'd have to leave the country if Trump were elected. In spite of my classical training and admonitions about diagnosis, I agreed with him. Neither of us evaluated or treated Trump, and our diagnoses were politically motivated, whether or not we are accurate. And neither of us has left the country, and we are to go. Lance Dotus, MD, was the lead writer of a public New York Times letter signed by 35 psychoanalysts and has been interviewed on major TV shows. As a physician psychoanalyst, he is less concerned with breaking the Goldwater Rule than, the men, than that mental health professionals stand against and stop Trump's authoritarian and irrational behaviors because they are harmful and damaging. They have harmful and damaging consequences. He strongly believes that Trump's well-documented traits require that mental health professionals exert our duty to warn and overrides the gold border rule not to diagnose in absentia. Dr. Dotus believes that pub publicly in diagnosing enduring character traits is not the same as endorsing a particular label in the DSM, which changes every few years. He believes that Trump is clinically and significantly impaired and that he is dangerous especially but not only because he is in charge of the nuclear codes. It is important to note that a number of psychoanalysts vehemently disagree with him. Modern conflict theory based on Freud is the framework for my perspective. Without a semester to teach it, I can briefly mention only a few dynamics that fit a psychoanalytic case formulation of an insecure, unlikable child who is now our president. Tony Schwartz, Trump's co-author for Art of the Deal, and is also a staff member, not that he's the staff member, but another person, a staff member who worked for Trump, as reported to an analyst friend, assert that the man of almost 71 today is childish, hyperactive, with hardly any attention span, and a bragger who is quick to attack. He needs approval and adulation and to control people. Best one can tell, Trump exhibits a primitive nature, little self-control or discipline, and is preoccupied and self-absorbed. His history includes a tough, dominating, harsh if not abusive father and traditional mother in the background. Trump is obsessed with gold and all things grand. He strongly believes he can save us from World War III and achieve world peace. Most of us are familiar with Trump's bad character and behaviors, but regardless, according to most of the analysts on my professional listservs, this is a man who is untreatable, with character armor that is impervious, and he would never end up in the consulting office of a psychoanalyst. Conclusion, some options to preserve democracy and stop gaslighting and authoritarian techniques. One of the most interesting op-eds on the subject is The Right Way to Resist Trump by Luigi Zagalas, who says he already saw the movie in Italy when Silvio Berlusconi was prime minister for nine years between 1994 and 2011. Zagalas integrates this psychohistorical analysis by reporting success when there is a focus on policy issues and accurate journalism instead of personality, contest, and tabloid news. He writes, the Italian experience provides a blueprint for how to defeat Mr. Trump. He demonstrates that eventually a focus on the issues, not character, wins the day. He argues that it adds to the opposition's credibility to find points in common, not just the differences. In his opinion, ridiculing a leader's behavior and or denying a legitimate win provides free advertising. I agree that policy issues and accurate journalism are critical instead of the elevation of celebrity culture, but we also need to elevate psychology and psychohistory. Character, personality, temperament, motivation and defenses and the psychology of our leaders 
have long been ignored as if they are irrelevant. For the most part, we have paid dearly for this omission. The McCarthy, Nixon, Bill, and Hillary Clinton scandals are but a few examples. From Robert Stern's recommendations for individuals, some common sense strategies that may also be applied to systems and groups include. One, stand up for reality. The mean, this means taking action against psychopathic and sociopathic modes of functioning as distinct from moral and ethical modes of functioning. An example is to minimize partisan bias by appointing a special counsel to head the investigation into Russian activities against the United States after the firing of James Comey. This was achieved when former FBI Director Robert Mueller was named special counsel. Two, just as important, we must stand firm against what Dr. Fuchsman calls the abandonment of civility. In early May, journalists were able to expose the legal but unethical and uncivil breach by Trump of confidential information from an ally. He shared with Russia highly classified code information from ISIS, about ISIS from Israel. It is his prerogative as POTUS and legal to declassify information. But Trump's judgment, wisdom, and the implications were questioned. Experienced security experts are appropriately concerned that Russia will share secrets with allies, Syria and Iran, and harm Israel. The effects on our diplomatic relations with Israel and the trust of other nations remain to be seen. During Trump's mid-May visit, to the Middle East, this trust seemed to remain intact, or so it appears. Three, I suggest we honor the free press and a return to investigative journalism with subscriptions and support. Ultimately, like it or not, Trump's supporters do not care whether he is a disordered gaslighter. They think the left is hysterical, crazy, and more menacing than Trump. Trump maintains that the left is on a witch hunt. Trump's supporters maintain that he is doing what he said he would be doing, bring back jobs, keep out Mexican murderers, and druggies, rapists, and the radical Muslims. Trump has made it okay to be a traditional man, sexist and racist. He is anti-constitutional, his goal is the destruction of the administrative state. To quote a Hillary Clinton supporter, Trump says the hell with civil rights or anything inconvenient about equal protection under the rule of law. In contrast, Trump loyalists do not see Trump's lies as lies, and when they do, they do not care. Is Trump playing head games with the elite? If so, is it conscious? Just as condescending and sneering as the left, the right snickers that Trump is getting over on the elites and moderates who have left them in the dust. In the movie Gaslight, Paula eventually comes to realize what her husband has been doing to her. How did this happen? An external third party from Scotland Yard, played by Joseph Cotton, who is investigating her husband for the murder of her aunt, steps in. He is well aware that her husband is tricking her and validates her perceptions of reality. Her husband is trying to gain possession of her aunt's jewels. She is not going crazy. So is special counsel Robert Mueller, the man whose investigation, like Joseph Cotton's, will reassure us that facts are facts, not lies or alternate facts? Will his work reassure us that we are not crazy, but rather be a step toward bipartisan focus on our democratic process? It will take a long time for Mueller to find the facts. This may be possible if three things do not occur. According to Neil Katyal, first, Trump has the prerogative to fire Mueller or change the special counsel regulations. Second, Congress can interfere by giving immunity to a witness, preventing criminal charges. Third, Acting Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein may define the scope and powers of the investigation. He may stop the special counsel, so long as he notifies the House and Senate Judiciary Committees. Using a simple psychoanalytic lens and our classical metaphors, one might say that our culture 
society and individuals, not just Trump and his administration, appear to lack sufficient ego. I define this concept as the part of the mind that mediates between the conscious and the unconscious. It is responsible for reality testing, judgment, and cognitive functioning. I define the concept of the id as the part of our psyche that initiates talk and behavior based on immediate gratification and impulse. I think of this part of me as I want what I want when I want it. A capacity for mentalization, the ability to understand other people have minds, and the ability to translate understanding and insight into rational and reasonable speech and behavior is the opposite of functioning on impulse or id functioning. Bemoaning what I perceive as our current and pervasive social and individual fragmentation, lack of integration and cohesion, I'm reminded of what Freud wrote in 1933 in volume 22, where it was, there shall ego be. It is a work of culture, not unlike the draining of the Zyder Z. Does that sound familiar? Whether you agree with my historical and psychoanalytic <coughs> perspectives today, I think you will agree that the people of the United States, of any color, race, ethnic group, religion, class, or political party, do not have to accept lies in our time, or from the past or the future. We do not have to live an existence where facts and reality are insignificant and in which someone adjusts the gaslights to achieve his or her own ends. <laughs>